I don't know if you've ever watched a baseball game or maybe played in one, and the situation was it was the bottom of the ninth inning and bases are loaded, three balls and two strikes count on the batter, and the announcer could say, and it all comes down to this. Or you're playing basketball and your team's down by one, but they have the ball in their possession, 10 seconds on the clock, and it all comes down to this. Or you're watching your favorite football team play the Philadelphia Eagles, in case you didn't know it was your football team too. (laughs) And they're playing in the World Series. No, they're not. They're playing in the Super Bowl. That was the other Philadelphia team who played for a championship and lost. They're playing in a Super Bowl, and the team they're playing against, the Kansas City Chiefs, time is running out, and they're about to kick a chip shot field goal because some bootleg referee made a call that he shouldn't have made, but I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm really not. You need to keep praying for me. But the announcer says, and it all comes down to this. Or you've been carrying around that engagement ring for weeks, for months maybe, waiting for the right time. I I mean, you know you love her, but man, she's out of your league. Anybody in here, guy, your girlfriend, fiance, wife, she's out of your league? This would be a perfect time for you to raise your hand, folks, trying to help you out. So there's finally that right time, and you pick the perfect place, and you have the right words, And you take a knee and you look her in the eyes and you say what you say. And it all comes down to this. And I'm sure there's many other things in our lives where that phrase could be said. And it all comes down to this. But there's nothing more important. Nothing more significant. Nothing more life changing than what we decide to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Where you could say, and it all comes down to this, because it does. It does. Before we read Luke's account today of the resurrection in Luke chapter 24, I want to ask you to join your hearts together with mine for a word of prayer. God, we come before you today And God, I pray that that you would calm my heart, that you would calm my nerves as I stand in front of these incredible people and I tell them about the most amazing event and story that's ever taken place. And God, my prayer as always is that you would help us to to open our eyes to see what we need to see in our own lives, not worrying about anybody else. To open our ears so that we can hear what we need to hear about us and nobody else. And God, would you please open up our hearts because that is where the true life change takes place. So God, I pray that you would help me to explain this story, to talk about this story in an understandable way so that every single person has the opportunity to understand, to know, and to respond to this amazing story. And God, we will give you all the honor and glory and praise for everything that you are going to do in our services today. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? I love that question. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. 
and returned from the, returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to, to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. He went home marveling at what had happened. Easter Resurrection Sunday. This is so important because nothing else would matter, not just in our yearly calendars, but for our entire lives, nothing would matter if Jesus didn't do what he said he would do. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said, nothing else would matter. I hope you're okay with my approach today. I, I guess even if you're not, too bad, because I'm the one with the microphone. But I want to keep things as simple as possible today, if that's okay. Because I think this Easter story is real easy to overcomplicate. I think this Easter story is so easy to, as a preacher to try to be overly creative and talk about something in a way that's never been talked about before. But let's be honest, how many different ways can somebody preach a sermon on Resurrection Sunday? This is my 15th Easter sermon that I've preached. And so this is nothing new. It's nothing different. But let me tell you, let me start by telling you about the worst Easter sermon that I've ever preached. It was Easter 2020. Do you remember Easter 2020? We weren't, why, because it was that bad? Is that why you remember it? <laughs> I know that, but Easter 2020, we weren't meeting in person. We didn't meet in person that Easter. And we were currently meeting at, on Summerfield Road, but all of our services were online at that time. And up until that point, we were still doing like music and I was preaching a sermon in an empty auditorium. So for some reason, I thought, you know what? I'm going to change it up a little bit this year. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to preach this Sunday sermon from my daughter Savannah's bedroom for no other reason then because she has a beautiful pallet wall that would serve as a wonderful backdrop. Big mistake. So there I stand, preaching into an iPhone with my suit coat on and sweatpants <laughs> because the phone only caught from this far up and I pray it didn't fall. And I'm going to tell you what. It was absolutely horrible. It looked horrible. It sounded horrible. I'm telling you, I look like one of those hostage videos <laughs> that a lot of churches were producing at that time because their online presence was non-existent. And I would have done so much better just standing there and saying, please just send me $10,000 and I promise you I'll never do it like this again. So, so bad, and I'll never forget it. So let's keep it simple today, because the bottom line is everybody needs to know that it all comes down to this. And if you're here today, and if you have not yet given your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be your Savior, to be your Lord, then even more so for you, it all comes down to this. So I want to point out just two, just two observations from this incredible story about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number one, it is the most important event that ever occurred. Not only is it the most amazing thing that has ever taken place, but it's the most important thing that has ever happened. Let's look at the first eight verses again from our text. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, 
taking the spices they had prepared and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But they went in and in, they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, the two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their heads or faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. Folks, the story of the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has continued to impact and change people's lives for the last 2,000 years. It is the most important event that has ever happened. And, and the most important event comes with it, the most amazing story ever told. So let me walk through this and let me break it, it down in a couple different ways. First of all, the birth of Jesus. Now you gotta understand about the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus was a normal birth, but it was also unique. Now, the conception was anything but normal. But what I mean when I say that the birth of Jesus was normal, what I mean by that is saying it's not like Jesus just all of a sudden appeared out of nowhere in a mist and just started walking around and people are like, who are you? Where'd you come from? No, it was normal because the birth of Jesus was just like any other birth. Think about it. The son of God was born just like you and I have been born. We, we were given birth to by our mother, just like Jesus. His birth was normal in that regards. Now, there was a different setting in different conditions because unless I don't know this about your life, I don't think anybody in here was born in a feeding trough. So yes, there are differences in that, but what I'm trying to say is he was born just like you and I. Mary went through the normal process of pregnancy and delivery. So I'm sure Mary connected with some of you ladies and, and maybe she had the, the same cravings as some of you and maybe she sent Joseph out at two in the morning to go to Walmart and get some pickles and ice cream. I don't know. But, but, it, but it was normal just like everybody else's but it was also unique because Jesus wasn't just born of a woman. Jesus was born of a virgin. Therein, it was unique. And this means that Jesus is completely untainted by sin. When Jesus was born, he came into this world, unlike us, with no sin nature. When we're born, we're born with a sin nature. Jesus was not. He was untainted by sin. Now, the death of Jesus, well, guess what? The death of Jesus was not necessarily unique in regards to the fact that it wasn't the first ever Roman execution and it wasn't the last Roman execution. So in those regards, his death was normal. In fact, on that day, the Bible says that he was not the only one who died on a cross. That, that he was crucified between two criminals. So other people were crucified like Jesus was crucified. What makes it unique is this, that although three people died that day, only one of their death was good enough to pay for the penalty of our sins. Only one of those deaths, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, allowed, allowed God to be satisfied, his wrath to be satisfied, and, and righteousness be able to be shown through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 3 and verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Peter writes this in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. He also writes this one chapter later in chapter 3 and verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, 
the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Folks, the death of Jesus Christ was so important because it was the only way, the only way that there would ever be a chance that my sins and your sins could ever be forgiven. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross. But here's the thing. That only serves the purpose that it was meant to if we put our faith and trust and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we allow him to totally transform our lives. You see, I'm here to tell you today that just because Jesus died on the cross doesn't mean that you're automatically a Christian. Just because this did happen. Just because this was true. What have you done with his death? What have you done? So his birth was unique. His death was unique. Surely his resurrection was unique, right? Well, kinda. (laughs) Kinda. I mean, we don't see resurrections taking place today, and I, for one, thank God for that because I don't know how I would respond if I saw someone who was dead, dead, and who's now alive. So resurrections don't take place today in our day and age, but if you read your New Testament of Scripture, the New Testament records three different people other than Jesus who rose from the dead. They were once dead, but then they were not dead. You have the the widow's son in the town of Nain. Now imagine this story, because this young man, he was dead. They were actually in the middle of the funeral procession. And Jesus shows up, and he brings the boy back to life. (laughs) That's one. You have Jairus' daughter. Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. His daughter was brought back to life by Jesus. And then Jesus also brought his good buddy Lazarus back to life. So so the resurrection of the dead was not necessarily anything new. You go a little further into the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 9, Peter brought somebody back to life. In Acts chapter 20, Paul brought somebody back to life. And that's the least he could do for that guy because that guy died because Paul was preaching and Paul was preaching so long that he fell asleep and he fell out of the window of a house and he died. So that's the least Paul could do for him in regards to being long-winded that day. He brought him back to life. So the resurrection of Jesus was not completely unique in that sense. But it was totally unique in the fact that every one of those people who were raised from the dead eventually died again. They didn't stay alive forevermore. The, the, their resurrection back to life was temporary. But Jesus, his resurrection was final. His resurrection was complete. He rose again, and, and, and he's not, he wasn't, was not alive, but he is alive forevermore. But just because Jesus rose from the dead doesn't mean that you are automatically a born-again Christian. What have you done with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That determines whether or not you are saved. When you think about the major religions in the world, and I'm going to look at four, you've got Buddhism, and you have Islam, and you have Hinduism, and then, of course, you have Christianity. And Buddha is linked to Buddhism, and Muhammad is linked to Islam, and Hinduism doesn't really have just one historical figure that that founded that religion, and then obviously Jesus is linked to Christianity. My point is this, folks. If you were to go to the graves of Buddha and Muhammad, do you know what could very easily read over their grave, and it would be true? Occupied. 
But when you go to the grave of Jesus, do you know what's over his grave? He is not here. He is risen. And it makes all the difference in the world. I love that portion in, in Luke 24 and beginning in the middle of verse five. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why are you here? Because he's no longer dead. He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise and they remembered his words. Folks, it all comes down to this. It all comes down to this. Jesus Christ is risen. He has conquered death. He has, de de he has conquered the grave. He has defeated sin. He has defeated the enemy. He is triumphant. He is glorious. He is victorious. And guess what? He is for you. <laughs> he loves you so much that not only did he die a cruel death, but he rose from the dead so that you and I could be forgiven. I heard a story about a Sunday school teacher who wanted to teach her kids in her class this important lesson. And so what she did was she got three jars and she put several earthworms in each of the three jars. And in one jar, she poured alcohol. And in the other jar, she put cigarette smoke. And in the last jar, she put tons of sugar. And so she took those jars to her class and she showed the kids. And in each and every one of those jars, every single worm died. So she said to her class, can anyone tell me the lesson that you can learn from this illustration? And the class was quiet. And one little boy finally spoke up and said, if you drink a lot, if you smoke a lot, and if you eat a lot of candy, you won't get worms. <laughs> so even though that young boy maybe missed the point of the illustration, can I encourage you today to don't miss the point. Don't miss this. It all comes down to this. What have you done with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the only thing that matters. So it's the most important event that has ever occurred. Number two, it's the most important decision you will ever make. You see, the most important event that ever happened calls for a decision. And that decision is the most important decision that you will ever make. Now here's the thing, and don't miss this, everyone makes a decision. Because if you choose to believe, if you choose to trust in what's being talked about today, if you choose to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, that's a decision. But if you choose to walk out of here in unbelief, choosing not to believe that Jesus did what he said he would do, and not to believe that, that he did this so, so we could have our sins forgiven, if you choose to reject that, guess what? It's a decision. Everybody makes a decision. And this is the most important decision you'll ever make. Look at verses 9 through 12 again from our text. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened." So these women who have just witnessed what they have witnessed, what do they want to do with this? They want to tell somebody. Like, like, and they even probably had in their mind, like, you know what? You're not going to believe this. And guess what? At first, they were right. <laughs> they didn't believe. Even though they've seen with their own eyes and even though that, that they've heard everything they've heard up to this point, they believe, but we read those tragic words at the end of verse 11, and they did not believe them. 
Now, they eventually did, but they didn't at the moment. They didn't at first. Can I challenge you today? Can I encourage you today to consider the claims of Jesus? Consider what Jesus is claiming, who he's claiming to be, what he's claiming to do in this story. Because, folks, this is not a fairy tale. This is not a myth. This is not some legend. This is reality. This really did happen, and there is more than enough physical, actual proof to prove that this did happen. And the same Jesus that rose again from the dead, not only did that, but this same Jesus is offering to live inside of each and every one of us through his Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the others didn't believe at first, but notice how verse 12 begins. But Peter, I love Peter. I really do. I, I, I loved him before we watched and rewatched The Chosen, but after The Chosen, if Peter's anything like that, I really love Peter because I think I connect with Peter. And I think a lot of you are like, yep, I'm the same way that Peter is. The others didn't believe, but Peter did. Now, John's account of the resurrection includes him and Peter running to the tomb, racing, and John even includes the, the element that he beat Peter. <laughs> like he beat him in the race to the tomb. But Luke's account, it, it doesn't have Peter and John, it just has Peter. He says, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Folks, you've got to hear me loudly and clearly when I say that one cannot continue to hear about the empty tomb and continue to reject it and walk away in unbelief. You cannot continue to do this. You cannot continue to live your life this way as one of unbelief. Can I encourage you to come and see? Come and see for yourself. And when you make the decision to come and see, do you know what you're going to see? You're going to see, you're going to find out that Jesus was who he said he was. Amen. And that Jesus truly did do what he said he was going to do. And Jesus did something that not only no one else could ever do, but has never been able to do again. Come and see. Come and see for yourself. Because the most amazing part of all of this is why he did it. You know why he did it? For someone like me who messes up and doesn't represent Christ all the time like I should. He did it for you and your sins. He did all of this so that we could one day spend an eternity in heaven with him. Folks, I, I, I can't stop emphasizing that it all comes down to this. It all comes down to these truths. And it needs to result in us believing and trusting and putting our faith in Jesus and allowing him to change our lives by us being willing to live, live a life of surrender and obedience to him. It has to happen in each and every one of our hearts and lives. But you're not going to be saved just because Jesus died on the cross. You're not going to be saved just because Jesus rose from the dead. You can only be saved by what you choose to do in belief of those things happening. And when that truly happens, your life is never the same. Your life continues to change every single day here on out. Folks, it's not about saying a bunch of words. 
It's not about repeating the words of a prayer that a preacher led you through or that a Sunday school teacher walked you through, which I'm glad they serve that purpose, and I'm gonna give you the opportunity here in a little bit, but the words of a preacher don't save anybody. It's not about dressing up for Easter Sunday because you better believe that you ain't gonna see me in one of these outside of weddings and funerals. It's not about all that. It's not about just going through the motions because you can go through the motions and you can do everything that you think you're supposed to do and you can still miss it. You can still miss it. You can be just like Judas who spent three years following Jesus, listening to the sermons, watching the miracles, and he still sold Jesus out. It's not about any of those things. You have a choice to make. We all have a choice to make, and it's the most important choice you will ever make. What are you going to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? How is the resurrection of Jesus Christ going to not only save you, but change your life forevermore. It's the most important moment in your life because it's the moment that separates victory from defeat. It's the moment that separates winning from losing. It's the moment that separates light and death. It's the most important decision you will ever make. Folks, God's plan through a son, Jesus Christ, was not completed on Friday. It included Friday, and don't get me wrong, I'm not selling Friday short, because it was a very important part of this story, of this plan, but it didn't end on Friday, and the only reason why Good Friday can ever be good is because of what happened on Sunday. But you have to take what happened on Sunday, and you got to put your faith and trust and belief in it. And you've got to give the Lord permission to get things out of your life that don't need to be there. And put things in your life that do need to be there. With this decision, you are saying, Lord, not only are you saving me, but I'm yours. I'm yours. You're going to do with me whatever you want to do with me. You're going to help me walk in the way that I need to walk. You're going to help me to speak in the way that I need to speak. God's message, God's plan was completed on Resurrection Sunday. He is not here. He is risen. And it all comes down to this. What will you do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Would you pray with me? With every head bowed and every eye closed, As I mentioned a little earlier, the words of a of a preacher do not save anyone. But people help others walk through a prayer because somebody doesn't necessarily know what they need to pray, what they need to say. But can I just encourage you one last time before we close this service that if you haven't given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, not only is it the most important choice that you ever make, but the choice is yours to make now. But please know that just repeating something that I'm saying and not really meaning it and having no desire for it to change your heart and life is not gonna save anybody. That prayer is not making it out of this room. Would you pray from your heart to God if you need to, if you need to today, for the first time in your life, to give your heart and life to Jesus, would you take care of that today? Would that be the choice that you make today? Not anybody else, not for anybody else, but for you. Will you give your heart and life to Jesus today? Would you pray right where you are in the quietness of this room, just from your heart to God? Would you pray, dear God, I come before you today 
And I know that just because these are the words that, that Craig is saying, that that doesn't necessarily save me. But me praying this prayer and meaning it in my heart, because today I put my faith in you. I put my trust in you. I put my belief in you because you are the only one who saves. And you did that for me through your life, death, and resurrection. So today, as best I know how, I am putting control of my life into your hands. Help me to live a life of obedience. Help me to live a life of surrender. With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, if you prayed that prayer today and you meant that prayer from the bottom of your heart and you did what you needed to do in making that choice and making that decision to follow Jesus and you, you've never done that before prior to today, would you do me a favor so I know how to continue to pray for you so that I can celebrate with you, so that we can celebrate for the fact that another sinner has come home. So if you prayed that prayer, nobody else is looking around in this room, but you prayed that prayer and you meant it, would you just do me a favor right now? Would you just slip your hand up? If that's you, God bless 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 you. Anybody else as we wait? God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you up here. Anybody else? Say, I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ for the first time today. Is there anybody else? God bless you. You can put your hands down. I pray that you would have the confidence to tell somebody, to tell me, to tell somebody that I gave my heart and life to Jesus today and I'm a child of the King. And I pray that this would be a day that is never forgotten and that you can always look back on and say, that was the day that I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ. So God, thank you. Thank you for doing what only you can do through your son. Thank you for, for saving, for redeeming these people who have been added to the kingdom of God today because of the truth of your son's life and his death and his resurrection. So God, help us to come alongside these people as they begin this new journey of following you. And God, may the rest of us, if, if we've kind of fallen off, if we're kind of slacking, if we've faded, God, I pray that today has reminded us about the truth of how much you love us and how much you want to continue to do for us. So God, thank you for incredible moments like this. May we never soon forget. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen.